Would you pay more attention to me if I did this? Or this? How about this? We live in a world that likes to put the filter on, don't we? But what if some of God's best blessings came from truth without the filter? That's what my brand new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter, is all about. It dives into some of Jesus' toughest teachings, but reminds us that within them we find unfailing love, stable truth, and God's help for our toughest times. It proves to you why Jesus, he may be difficult, but he's always worth following. Jesus Christ called himself a lot of controversial names. In fact, if you've ever worshipped here live at the core and grabbed a cup of coffee out in the lobby, you might have looked up and seen a wall uh, where we have painted and printed this massive name of Jesus. And all around Jesus are the names that he called himself or that other people called him. In case you're watching at home, let me show you a picture of the wall I'm talking about. There, in big block letters, the name of Jesus and then around these titles that when you give them just 10 seconds of thought, you, you realize they are incredibly controversial to call yourself by. Like the title, I Am. Do you know enough about the Bible to realize what that means? Now, back in the days of uh, the Exodus, the days of Moses, uh, God appeared to Moses the prophet in a burning bush and Moses didn't know what to make of it. And he said, well, God, if I go to your people, who should I tell them is sending me? And God responded with his name, just two words, I am. And so in John chapter 8, when Jesus was speaking to the religious leaders of Israel, and he said, before Abraham was born, before Moses even existed, I am. It was a confrontational thing to say. And so the people picked up stones to stone Jesus. Who does he think he is saying he's the I am? But there's other names too, the names like Lord, and king and master, where Jesus wasn't just claiming to be a nice guy or a good example. He was claiming to be the master and we are the servant. He is the king who gives the commands. He is the Lord who gets the last word. He's not just a nice counselor you pay by the hour. He claims to be the ultimate authority. In fact, so much authority, he came down from heaven itself. All these controversial names that divided people back in the days of Jesus, but there's one I want to put up on the screen that seems maybe a little less controversial. Where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. If there's one thing that Jesus called himself that you would think would make people put down their stones, it would be this. Because come on, what is more tender and more comforting and more sweet and more nice than thinking of Jesus as the good shepherd? It's like little kids' Christian decor, right? Fluffy sheep. Here's Jesus with his nice beard and a big smile, and he's holding a little lamb in his arms. That's, it, you know, it's 42% likely if Christians open a preschool, they're going to call it the little lamb's daycare because it's just so sweet and so nice. Here's Jesus, and he's so loving, he's so kind, and he's carrying a little lamb over his shoulder. It's like, I'm the rock, the master, the Lord, the great I am. That's like confrontational language from Jesus, but the good shepherd is the softer side of him, is it not? And yet, <laughs> and yet, <laughs> if you would open your Bible to John chapter 10 and look at the original time when Jesus called himself that, what you will find in the verses that follow are not crowds of people saying, aw, is that nice of Jesus? Instead, let me show you the reaction that people had when Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd. The Jews who heard these words were again divided, Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Huh. When Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd, just like all the other times, people were divided. They, they had to pick a side. No one could say that Jesus was nice or Jesus was their pastime or their hobby. They either followed him, loved him, gave up everything and worshipped him, or they said things like, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why would you bother with him? You know, in this sermon series, I've, I've trying to been get you, trying to get you off the fence when it comes to Jesus. 
if to be a person uh, maybe who goes to church or is kind of spiritual and gives a shout out to Jesus when life is off the rails, it just, it's really not a biblical option. It's not honest based on what Jesus said about himself. You can love him or you can hate him, but don't be indifferent about him. You can say he's demon-possessed or you can call him the deity that came down from heaven, but don't, don't show up two times a year to church because he's kind of nice and you could use a little spiritual boost. No, Jesus divides people one from the other. He forces you to pick a side. So I guess today my question for you is which side are you on with Jesus? Uh, it makes me think of C.S. Lewis. Uh, some of you know the amazing spiritual story of the man who later wrote their Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, C.S. Lewis kind of grew up in church, but then he rejected it. He's a incredibly brilliant kid. He became an atheist in his teenage years. He started to teach, I believe, at Oxford and Cambridge, one of the brightest minds in all of Europe. But then, through his friendship with J.R.R. Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings guy, he became a Christian. And C.S. Lewis used his brilliant Oxford mind to actually read the unfiltered Jesus in the Bible. And what he came to the conclusion was that you really only have three options with Jesus, and there's not a fourth. You can call Jesus a liar, you can call him a lunatic, or you can call him Lord, and there's no fourth option. A guy who claims to be the great I am, the Lord, the master, the rock, the bread that came from heaven, the light of the world, the one that you need to survive, you can call him a liar if you want. Or you can be convinced that he's convinced of it, but he's kind of crazy, demon-possessed, raving mad. You can call him a lunatic. Or, option three, as Christians claim, you could believe him, follow him, call him the Lord who gets the last word. But C.S. Lewis would say, Jesus did not leave us open a fourth option. He was blunt, in fact. He said, let's give up this patronizing nonsense about calling him a good example or a great moral teacher. He did not leave that door open to us. So back to my big question for today. What, what do you think of Jesus? Is he a liar who knew he was not God but claimed to be? Is he a lunatic who thought he was God but was incredibly deceived? Or is he the Lord that will get the last word over every part of every day of the rest of your life? Today I want you to think about that question as we go back to one of the more familiar things that Jesus said about himself, but we're going to look at it today with fresh eyes. Let's look at maybe one of the more controversial things that Jesus claimed when he said that he is our good shepherd. If you're taking notes in your program or you're watching at home, I'd love for you to write this down. I think the proper way to understand Jesus' words would be by saying this, Jesus is our good shepherd, no offense, and thank God. Today, Jesus, in these classic words from John 10, is going to offend us and hopefully send us out with gratitude and thanks in our hearts. You might be so offended, you'll leave. You might be so thankful, you'll stay. But today, I want to leave you with no room in between. So let's jump back into our Bibles. John chapter 10, we start with verse 11, where Jesus himself, the unfiltered Jesus, spoke these words. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock, scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. To describe himself, Jesus chooses uh, something that every one of his neighbors would have been familiar with, but most of us are not. How many of you here have ever raised sheep? Two hands. All right, that was one to two more than I was expecting <laughs> for this church service. Yeah, let, let's think for a second. Jesus uses the word shepherd, shepherd, shepherd three times, and sheep, 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 sheep four times. So let's, let's think critically about sheep for a second. I actually brought a friend with me today. Let me introduce you to my friend, the sheep. <laughs> we practiced that, didn't we? Yeah, well done. All right. So, um, what do you know about sheep? 
Uh, sheep are a, a huge animal in modern life, and they were a huge animal in ancient life for a bunch of good things that sheep could provide. Right? Sheep grow wool. We turn wool into fabrics. We stuff our mattresses, our pillows. Maybe you had a good night's sleep last night, thanks to a friendly sheep. Uh, sheep provide milk, which is turned into cheese. They can provide meat. Uh, people in the ancient world, if they were rich and wealthy, would have tons of sheep because they could clothe you, they could feed you, they could make you rich. But sheep had two really big flaws. I'm going to jot a note about these flaws. N number one, sheep by their very nature were prone to wander. Right? Sheep would very rarely pop up their heads, look around, and make sure they were staying close to their shepherd. Instead, what they would often do is notice a little plotch of grass, and notice another one, and notice another one, and, and bit by bit and bite by bite, they would end up rather far from their shepherd. They were prone to wander. Most sheep weren't rebellious. You know, they didn't give the middle hoof to their shepherd. <laughs> you know, go take it off for some other pasture. They just got interested in something that wasn't necessarily bad. It was good. It fed them. They just pursued it so much that they ended up a, a big distance from the shepherd who would care for them. What made it even worse is that sheep have something within them that you might have heard of called the flocking instinct. Um, sheep sometimes get separated all by themselves, but that's very rare because their instinct is to stay with the rest of the flock. And so if their buddy, Sean the sheep, you know, pursues a little bit of grass, our instinct is to stay with Sean, even if Sean is separated from the shepherd. We feel like we're in the right spot when we're close to them, even if they are very far from him. A sheep's fatal flaw is that it's prone to wander from the only one that can keep it safe. And here's the second flaw. When a sheep has wandered, it ends up in grave danger because of this guy. It's amazing what you can find on Amazon these days, is it not? <laughs> all right, here's the wolf. Let me make sure I get all these claws out here so you can see them. Um, I did a bunch of Google research. Sheep, on average, run about 20 miles an hour. Top speed, they hit 25. Jamaican sheep can get to about 27. That's not true. I don't know if there's Jamaican sheep. <laughs> right? So they're, they're fast. They could out-sprint me if I was chasing it, but not, not a wolf. A wolf can easily run 25, 30, up to 37 miles an hour. He's going to, like a JV wolf, can catch a varsity sheep every time. And once it catches it, a sheep's fatal flaw is that it has no natural defenses. Right? There's no claws here like a bear to fight back. There's no jaws like a shark to bite back. There's no scales on the back to protect it from the wolf. There's no strong tail like an alligator. A, a sheep, in fact, as its wool grows, it gets heavier and slower. If it wanders from the good shepherd, if it gets isolated, well, we'd say a sheep is dead meat. The two fatal flaws that Jesus wants us to think about today is that sheep are prone to wander and sheep end up in very, very great danger. And no offense, but Jesus called you and me sheep, 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 sheep. Hmm. You realize what an insult this is once COVID hit, didn't you? You see it online when someone would share a new story about the side of the pandemic or that. You're not, a, you're not people, you've become sheeple. Your followers, you believe anything that they tell you. You're prone to wander after half-truths and lies. Well, Jesus would say, no offense, uh, that's all of us. Now, we as human beings are prone to wander from God. Very often, we're not trying to be spiritually rebellious. We're not tearing up the Bible in our backyard and burning its pages. Instead, what so often happens is we notice something that makes us happy and we pursue it and then we pursue it and then we pursue more of it and more of it and more of it without popping up our head to, to look and wonder, how close am I to Jesus right now? It's not that, that something is inherently bad, it's just that pursuing so much of it 
can go from a good thing into a forgetting about God thing, which is a very, very bad thing. Has ever happened to you in your life where just unintentionally you were going after some goal, some hope, some dream, and you ended up maybe in a not so safe and strong spiritual place? You know, maybe you're in school and uh, you just want to make it to college. Uh, be the first one in your family to get a higher education, to get the scholarship. And so you take the tougher classes, you, you pick the AP and there's the extra homework. And then you know you don't get the scholarship if you've poured out yourself into volunteer work. So you sign up for this and that. You're in this club, student council, sports. And, and rarely, rarely do students pop their heads up and say, is this good for my soul? That college isn't wrong. Scholarships aren't wrong. But we're so prone to think about the thing that we want that we can lose sight of the thing that we most need. It happens so frequently. I actually see kids who go to Christian high schools in our community who are convinced, I get enough Jesus during the week, I don't need to be a part of a church family on the weekend. What? Prone to wander. Or you just want to be good at sports. And all your friends are moving in this direction. You know, you got to start young. You got to play club. You got to go to the camp and there's nothing wrong with it. You, you want to get the spot. You know, you're not going to make the team unless you do this, this, and this. And so you make the commitment another night. And, and rare, rare are even the Christian parents who will pop their heads up and say, wait, wait, wait. Is this good for our faith? All these weekends away from our, our church home, is that actually good for our soul? Prone to wander. And maybe we're just hanging out with friends. And friends make jokes about this or that. Jokes that might be slightly discriminatory, might be sexist. We're prone to wander. In America, we see how everyone else lives and we follow the example. We're, we're used to 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 square feet with families who really give nothing with intentionality to the poor, the oppressed, and the downtrodden. It feels normal. We need another car, an upgrade, a new device. What? We never pop up our head to say, well, what did Jesus say about money? We're people who are prone to wander. We get invited to a bachelor party. Don't pop up our head to think, well, what does Jesus think? We're prone to drink what our buddies drink, to watch what our buddies watch. Sheeple. Jesus says that is what we are. We are prone to wander. Whether you don't know Jesus or you do, there's something in your heart that sees something good and it pursues it and pursues it and pursues it. And very rare is the soul that's sensitive enough to think, where's Jesus right now? Am I close to my good shepherd? And even worse, if you've wandered, you're in grave danger. I would love to drop some modern American mantra on you that you're brave and you're strong and you can do it. But if you're a sheep, you can't fight back against the wolf. You might be a better human being than your brother or your sister. You might be the fastest sheep in the whole flock, but you still can't outrun the wolf of regret and sin and death. And hell, you could try harder, you could run faster, but if you're separated from the only God who can protect you, you will not be protected. Jesus says you are sheep. Sheep, 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 prone to wander and in great danger. And now you understand why people said, he's demon-possessed. Come on, come on, Jesus, I'm I'm not in danger. I'm a decent human being. I'm, God's not going to be... Hell? What? Me? Come on, why listen to this guy? Instead of flattering people, Jesus called them sheep. Instead of saying they were strong, he called them weak. Instead of calling humans good, he called all of us wicked. Why would you listen to him? 
That's the right question. So I hand back my friends. I want you to think about that question. Why would you listen to Jesus? Uh, there are many philosophies, m- many podcasts, in fact, many religions that would flatter you a million times more than this book does. They would call you good, better than average, worthy, deserving. Of course you're going to have a better life after this one ends. You're you, but Jesus does not say that. Instead, he calls himself the shepherd and you the sheep. No, no offense. So why would you come back? Why would you keep reading this book, watching this show, attending this church, or following Jesus? I actually thought of that question um, 12 hours ago. Um, Yesterday, I was down in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for my daughter's band concert. And in the lobby of the Christian high school where we were was this memorial uh, for a girl who died about 20 years ago. A 16-year-old had cancer, passed away, and right on the wall, this massive mosaic, taller than me, of Jesus as a shepherd. Like The centerpiece there in the lobby of this high school is a giant Jesus, basically saying, you're all sheep. He's the shepherd. Why, why would people proclaim that message of Jesus? Isn't it demeaning or insulting to us? Or to make it more personal, why uh, above my daughter's head and above my daughter's bed is a framed picture of Jesus holding a tiny lamb? Why not tell her she's a lion, a tiger, an eagle? Why raise the, the daughter that I love, who I want to be so strong, to tell her that she's just a little sheep? Well, Jesus knows. Let me read to you one more time these words from John chapter 10. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. And the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. You see, Jesus here is not just saying, you're the sheep, I'm the shepherd. He, he chooses and then repeats three times this epic word, good. Now, in the Greek language of the New Testament, there's multiple words for good. Um, this one has the flavor of something that is of the highest moral quality. It's the most admirable, the most beautiful. In other words, line up all the shepherds, put the most beautiful, inspiring one at the front of the line, and you would be looking at the face of Jesus. And he explains why. I'm the good shepherd because I lay down my life. When the wolf comes, when danger approaches, the hired hand getting paid by the hour, he takes off. He doesn't love the flock. But I stay, I fight. I get bit, I I bleed, I lay down my life. I don't run away when you need me the most. Uh, There's often um, actually something very powerful about being in the city of Jerusalem. If you look at a Google map after church today, um, you would find out that the city of Jerusalem is this major metropolitan area. Hundreds of thousands of people live. But just outside of the main part of the city to the east is absolute desolation and desert. Shocking. You you get on a tour bus, you're in the middle of this big city, ancient ruins, and like two minutes later, you look around and there's nothing. The landscape plunges down to the Dead Sea, thousands of feet, little caves, places to hide, which is very fitting for what happened to Jesus the night before he died. See, in the center of the city, Jesus' friend Judas had betrayed him. Uh, The soldiers and the Pharisees were gathering their torches and their swords to come get Jesus. And Jesus was praying in a garden on the east side of the city, the Garden of Gethsemane. In other words, the wolf, the threat, was coming from the west. And Jesus was so close to running away to the east. Like his ancestor David who had lived a thousand years before him, he could have bolted. He knew the danger was coming. He could have run away, hidden in a cave, gotten away from the torches, the swords, 
and the wolf. But Jesus did not. Read the Gospels. Jesus gets up from his prayer and he walks to the west to those who came to arrest him because he was not a shepherd who would run away from danger. He was one, he said, who would lay down his life for the sheep. What makes Jesus so unspeakably good is the fact that he was not in this shepherding business for himself. Even though it would cost him, even though he would have to lay down his life, bleed and die on a cross for the forgiveness of your sins, he was willing to do it. I am the good shepherd, he claimed. And here's why the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Yeah, I'm kind of embarrassed. It took me 42 years to think about this. But just last week, that phrase caught my attention, lays down his life for the sheep. Think with me for a second. Why would anyone become a shepherd? Well, why would someone choose that boring job of watching sheep shivering on a cold night to keep the flock together? Well, well, there's a simple answer. They would do it for themselves. Right? If sheep can produce wool and clothe my family, if they can produce milk and feed my family, if I can sell them for beef and get rich, it might be hard work, but I will shepherd this flock for myself to feed me, to keep me alive, to make me prosperous. Right? I'll, I'll lay down my comfort, I'll sacrifice, because in the end, the ROI on being a shepherd with these sheep is positive. But now think about Jesus. When he's up in heaven and he sees all of us wandering like lost sheep on earth, why does he become the good shepherd? Does he need clothes from us? No. <laughs> he was clothed in splendor and glory up in heaven. Does he need food from us? Just to make him lunch? <laughs> feasting with saints and angels for all eternity. What, what does he need from us? The answer is nothing. So why would Jesus become a shepherd? Here's the answer. For the sheep. What shepherd in all of human history would not just give his time or his energy or his wealth, but his life for the sheep? And the answer is only one. Only Jesus. And the reason Jesus is the good, the most moral shepherd, is because he laid down his life for the sheep. When he needed nothing and we needed everything, Jesus did something. When we could offer him nothing and we owed him everything, Jesus did Something He laid down his life in the greatest sacrifice and the greatest act of pure, unconditional love that history has ever known. If someone asked me today, why would you stick with Jesus? He calls you a sinner, dependent, weak, a sheep. My simple answer would be, who else has loved me like Jesus? You got me a birthday present? Thank you. Jesus laid down his life for me. You raised me when I was a kid, mom? That's beautiful. Jesus gave way more than a few years of his time. He gave his very body and his very blood. Some people in this world will flatter you. Some people will do nice things for you. Some people will love you, but no one, no one, no one will be like Jesus for you. I am the good shepherd. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So, Back to our question, what will you do with Jesus? If you can't respect him as a moral teacher or a religious founder, if you have to choose between calling him a liar or a lunatic or the Lord, what, what will you do? You know, some people in our self-affirmation world will say he's demon-possessed and crazy. I, I suppose you could do that too. But I prefer to follow the one Jesus who gave up everything that I could be part of his flock. And I hope you do too. 
Friends, there's no one for the rest of your life who will love you like Jesus. No one who will sacrifice like Jesus. Hear the voice of pure goodness today and follow him as your good shepherd. That's what Robert did. I'm going to invite our band to come back up on stage as I tell you the amazing story of a 22-year-old who wrote one of Christianity's most classic hymns. Uh, His name was Robert Robinson. He lived about 300 years ago in the 1700s, and if Robert knew one thing about himself, it was that he was prone to wander. Uh, Before he became a Christian, he was prone to wander into all sorts of things that Jesus wasn't okay with. And in fact, Robert was pretty honest because he said, even after becoming a Christian, after going to church and after knowing the truth, his heart was still prone to wander. He was so easily tempted by words and choices that he should not have chosen. And yet he also realized at the same time the immense goodness of his good shepherd, Jesus. And so in the 1700s, Robert Robinson wrote the classic words of a hymn entitled, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Have you heard it? He wrote classic lyrics like this. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold or the flock of God. He, to rescue me from danger, bought me with his precious blood. I wandered. I was just a stranger. And yet Jesus sought me. He bought me. He rescued me from danger with his precious blood. He is the good shepherd. And he came back in the final stanza, to say this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. God, it's so easy for me to be led astray, and yet you love. Take my heart. You're worth it. No matter how much you challenge me, how much you want to change me, you're worth it. Take my heart and seal it for thy courts above. Or as the Old Testament prophecy so beautifully said, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the sin of us all. So I want to invite you to please stand. We're going to join in this classic hymn. As you catch on with our musicians, I invite you to sing. I invite you to sing at home too. Let's lift up our praises as wandering sheep to the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Please join us as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Let's pray. Uh, dear God, we feel it. For some of us, it's jealousy or insecurity. For some of us, it's pride and thinking too little of others. For some of us, God, it's sexual temptation, it's alcohol, it's uh, addiction, it's fear. It's worrying about the future as if you are not in control. God, we, we feel it. We are so prone to wander, and that's why we love you. When we were in great danger, you sought us, you fought for us, you bought us back with your precious blood. Heavenly Father, we deserve none of it, and you gave all of it. So today, once more, we remember that Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. Jesus is always worthy. Help us to sing his praises now and forever. God, we call you today not just Lord, not just King, not just Messiah, not just Christ, but today we lift up that beautiful name that you are the great I am, the I am who called himself our good shepherd. It's in your name that we pray all these things. And all God's people say, amen. Important message today from Pastor Mike, reminding us that we may wander easily, but Jesus loves us and gave his life to keep us safe. And you can keep that message front and center in your life with Pastor Mike's new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter. This book helps you navigate through filters the world puts on Jesus so that you can get to the real Jesus, the only one who can offer you eternal life. Request your copy with your financial gift to Time of Grace. Would you pay more attention to me if I did this? Or this? How about this? We live in a world that likes to put the filter on, don't we? But what if some of God's best blessings came from truth without the filter? That's what my brand new book, Jesus Hashtag No Filter, is all about. It dives into some of Jesus' toughest teachings, but reminds us that within them we find unfailing love, stable truth, and God's help for our toughest times. It proves to you why Jesus, he may be difficult, but he's always worth following. Jesus Hashtag No Filter is our way of thanking you for your financial support. Request yours today by calling 800-661-3311, visiting timeofgrace.org, or writing us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin 53201. Nothing matters more than connecting people to God. Like that anxious teenager scrolling on her phone who doesn't really know who Jesus is, or that family that might look good from a distance, but they're barely keeping it together, or that Christian going through chemo who needs to know that she is going to see the face of God. Nothing matters more than connecting people just like that to the God of forgiveness, love, and power. And that is exactly what Grace Partners do. Grace Partners give regularly and generously to Time of Grace. Join me today in becoming a Grace Partner. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources. Or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. Do you need prayer? Contact us and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.